Good afternoon and welcome to APOC Japan Programs Winter Speaker Series. Nihon no mina san mo ohayou gozaimasu. Stanford Daigaku. Good morning to all the members. I am the Japanese doctor of the Stanford University's Asia Pacific Research Center. Today we have our first session for our winter webinar series titled Sparking Joy Across the Pacific, How Komari Became a Global Success. Thank you for attending this event. For this web series, we have the future of social tech as our theme. We will be focusing on how our lives and society will change with the development of new technologies, what problems innovation will solve, as well as what new problems it will create. We'll be focusing on fields such as content business and platforms, medical technology and its practical apl application, work cell reform and diversity, energy technology and climate change. And we will also discuss on how the connection between Japan and the US has been able to generate new developments in each of these fields, as well as what kind of expectations we can have from Japan and US's cooperation in the future. As mentioned, today is the first session of the series. I would like to talk about the world's most famous Japanese tithing consultant, whose book on tithing methods has sold over 30 million copies worldwide. And she has also a Netflix problem as well, tidying up with Marie Kondo. And she has also been chosen as one of the 100 most influential people in the world by Time Magazine. I would also like to point out that she is the first Japanese person to have been uh, to have her name used as English verb, kondoing. We also have here with us today her husband, Takumi Kawahara, who is also the producer of the Kaomari brand. And he also has played a significant role in the success of Kaomari method in Japan and the US and has his own book published. Uh, be yourself a textbook for shining your own way and changing your life and is helping um, many people produce themselves so today uh, please uh, help me welcome mr miss kawahara and mr uh, miss kondo today so i'm sure there are many of you in attendance today who are well aware of the komari method and who are believers of komari and happy to announce that we have uh, Ms. Komari here with us. Uh, she'll be sharing with us the essence of the Komari method in a condensed form. So first, we'll like to start with that. And afterwards, I would like to uh, interview the both of, both of them. I'll be asking some questions and we'll like to have a conversation. And we'll also like to be accepting questions from the audience today. So please feel free to send us questions in English, Japanese. All questions are welcome. Please utilize the Q&A function. We hope we get many questions uh, today. So please don't hesitate to ask uh, any questions if you have at any timing. I will also like to uh, direct those questions to the two of them. So let us uh, first uh, switch over to uh, Hara-san and also Okomari-san to talk about the Komari method. Hello, everybody. My name is Marie Gondo. So I am able to speak as a guest speaker for Stanford University. I am very honored. My method, uh, Komari method, Perhaps there are some people who are not too familiar with it. So I would like to briefly go over what that method is. I will also like to talk about why I have started researching and working on tidying. I would like to introduce those points as well, as long as a little bit about myself. In terms of tidying, I have started and took deep interest in this since I was five years old. My mom was uh, reading this uh, lifestyle magazine and I was actually very interested by it. And I was reading it a lot. And I took interest in tidying, especially when during that time, my mom was doing many um, activities within the household and I was very interested in what she was doing. So cooking, sewing, cleaning, everything was my favorite and I was very interested by it. And I was looking at the magazine and actually putting into practice. However, I was not good, in, good at tidying. So cooking, sewing, the more I do it, the better I got at. However, with tidying, no matter how many times I try to tidy up, it gets very messy and cluttered. 
So that was something that I had to really think about. And I was thinking about how can I get better at tidying so I don't have clutters everywhere. So I have been thinking about that as a child. So as you can understand, I was a bit of an odd child. Ever since I was in elementary school, or rather than playing with friends my age, I would rather spend my school break time cleaning up locker rooms in the school or organizing within the library. So those were some activities I was doing myself. And whilst I did those activities, there's a lot of books on tidying up and cleaning in Japan. And I was reading many of those books. And in order to be able to clean and tidy up, it said you have to throw away things, discard things, and I was really into doing that. So I got very deep into throwing away things, discarding things. However, no matter how many things I threw away, the cleaning didn't really progress, and I just kept on having the same issues. So there was a lot of stress coming from this, and there was some time uh, where I fainted. So I was getting very stressed out by this cleaning and I fainted. And I'm sure some of you are listening to this and probably wondering and doubting if that's really true. Uh, but it's very true. I got very sick and tired of cleaning and I actually really fainted and lost consciousness in the middle of the room once. And from that experience, I realized something. When I actually gained my consciousness, I was looking at all the things surrounding me. And they all kind of seemed like they were glowing. So it might seem very odd to you, but it looked like everything around me was glowing. And that's what uh, came to my mind. And I realized what's important when you're tidying or cleaning, it's not just about throwing things away. Actually, what is more important is about thinking about what you want to keep, something you don't need, something that you don't want inside your house or something you don't like something you don't, you dislike. Instead of choosing that, you want to look inside your house and find something you love, something you really want to cherish, something that actually makes you happy, something that really sparks joy in you. So that is something I realized in the second year of high school. So with that experience, I started thinking about choosing things that sparks joy. And that became a, a really outstanding char characteristic within my method I teach. Again, I realized that in my second year of my high school. So this Komari method, what I teach and tell other people, it's not just about cleaning things and making your house clean and organized. That's not the only point. It's also about looking at the things you have right now, examining it and seeing like what really fulfills your heart, what really sparks joy in you. And it's really about teaching that importance. And with doing that, you're able to realize you know, what really sparks joy in you. It also makes you realize, oh, these are the things I value in my life stage right now. This is the path I would like to pursue. So you're able to get more clarity as to what the what values you have in your life. And I also think that that's something that can be accomplished by tidying. In the Kondo method, the Komari method, you're able to choose uh, what you value in life, what is important to you. So when you are tidying or cleaning, I really would like for you to remember what your heart wants right now at this moment. And when you touch items, is your whole body really happy? Is it feeling happy? That's something I want you to think about. So that is uh, the basic principle of the Komari method. So Takumi, would you like to add something? So Marie, you were cleaning and I think you had to go to the hospital one time because you weren't able to look up. Oh, that's because I was carrying many heavy things and my neck my neck got stiff and I couldn't look up. Remember what the doctor wrote in your med medical records? Yes, I do remember. He said too much tidying. I think even if you look around the world, I don't think anybody else has the same medical records as you. To have the doctor actually say that you have cleaned too much that your neck got stiff and you couldn't turn upwards. Great. Thank you so much for that. So from here, 
I would like to ask you about the Komari method. So you have been able to spread that in Japan and all over the world. And I want you to kind of reflect on that experience. You first started as the tithing consultant in Japan. You started your business and you are in the US. And we have already received a couple of questions. You know, a lot of people asking questions about how your experience was in the US. What are some of the differences between the US and Japan? So those are some questions I would like to touch on later. So let me first ask you this. You first started your job as a tidying consultant in Japan. So what triggered that? You talked, uh, you just mentioned that as a child, you were interested and your mother was very influential in your life and you got very into cleaning, tidying. And since then, uh, your first job was uh, working at a major company. And even in that company, understand uh, you were really great. You were a high performer. You had number one sales and you have some friends uh, who you were helping out in terms of tidying, cleaning. And I think that was in 2009, you wanted to focus on the tidying aspect. And this, I believe, was a big decision for you. Can you share with us, you know, what your thinking was, how you were feeling? Was there some strong will, strong feeling uh, for you to pursue that path and fully focusing on being a tidying consultant? And I also understand how confident you were when you made those decisions. I want to understand your thinking. Um, at that time, what kind of strategy or what kind of plans did you have to start your business as a tidying consultant? Would you be able to share that with us? Sure. So I had experience uh, working in a workforce and that was about two years, I believe. And after two years, it's not that I suddenly decided to start my own business. So I had been doing this job as a tidying consultant since I was in college. And my second year in college, that was the first time when I received a compensation for the consultation work I was doing for. And I had friends in college and I had been cleaning my friend's house or tidying up my friend's house as a hobby. And when I became a college student, many of my friends uh, moved out and lived by themselves. And because of that, I had many friends who came to me and, and, and uh, where I had a lot of opportunities to be able to go to their homes to be able to clean. And I think since I started doing that, my friends started saying, oh, Marie, she's very good at cleaning. When she comes over, she's really good at tidying up. Then I started to receive a request to go to people's houses and tidy up their places with compensation. So I started to get paid and that became my job from a hobby. And then people started to um, introduce me to refer me to different people. So it was like a word of mouth. And the first year I was really busy working for this company, but after the second year, I was using weekend um, to work as a part-time tidying up consultant as my side business. And then this um, client that I was actually working um, for, they were, uh, this person was really um, interested in tidying up. And I was um, back then in charge of corporate sales. And this person um, that I went to meet the desk was really messy and I said, um, I said, okay, let's tidy up your desk before we start talking about hiring. And that was the moment this business person said, yes, I was meaning to do that. And I was meaning to tidy up my desk. And then I tidied up this desk. And then I started to give desk tidying up lessons. And while I was working for this company, before I go to work, like really early in the morning, like around um, 7 a.m. and then 9, I would go to work and then 
um, I work all day. So this morning hours and then Saturdays and Sundays, my yeah, those hours are actually filled with all this tidying up consultant work. And uh, then that actually made me realize that, okay, people really want this type of um, work or help support from me. And if there's so many people who want my help in tidying up, then I started to think maybe this was my calling and this was um, something I wanted to do. And after working for two years at this company, I um, actually um, I left the company and then started to my um, have my own business. So it wasn't something uh, that I decided very suddenly, but it was like a gradual uh, transformation and shift. So that was really interesting that um, you have friends um, um, who would ask you to come over and then tidy up. And I wish I had a, a good friend like you, but um, that was the, uh, the beginning of your business. So that was really interesting. So I became, you became an um, independent consultant. And then um, the uh, book, uh, The Life-Changing Magic of Tidying Up, uh, was published. And then I think you became very successful um, very quickly. So about this book, I think it uh, was a very interesting um, story that you actually started to write this book. So I became an independent uh, tidying up consultant. And uh, people, I started to receive requests in work orders um, through word of mouth. And then I decided to start this blog entries to talk about my um, profession. And then also um, small scale seminars on a regular basis. So that was what I was doing mainly at the beginning of my career as a cons um, consultant. So the point was that when you change, when you uh, finish tidying up, you don't really go back to messy rooms. And then through those tidying up in the process of cleaning up, um, their lives started to change. And then uh, before I realized there are so many requests and work requests, and I was so extremely busy. And then my tidying up lesson is five hours long and I would get three a lessons a day. So from uh, five to 11, noon to six, and then 6 p.m. to uh, 11 p.m. That was my work schedule as a consultant. And still my schedule was completely full. And then the um, when a new person wanted to make an appointment with me, they had to wait for six months. And then uh, some of them actually told me that they couldn't wait for six months. And then they were at, they asked me to write a book about how to tidy up. And now, of course, I've never written a book before, and I never thought about publishing a book. So I um, decided that I had to um, study and learn about um, writing and um, publishing a book. So I took a seminar how to uh, write books and also um, plans and business plans. And um, you were asked to give a presentation about how to write. And then in that presentation, in front of um, all these lecturers, instructors, I, um, I, everyone from all the publishing companies liked my presentation and my idea about those books. And then um, I um, was able to publish my book, my first book. So that was really amazing. If that was the, the case, it, there, there was probably a possibility that you could really focus on uh, really technical um, um, aspects of cleaning and tidying up. 
but I think it, it wasn't just that. It was more about how to change your life. So really that book was about how it was exactly the same as how I would teach in those tidying up seminars. So it wasn't something completely new that I've never taught or done. But I focused on how to express my ideas um, for the audience to be able to actually understand my method, just like I was giving lessons to my customers and clients. So how to greet at my client's house or how to appreciate items and objects you have. And then sometimes um, uh, the press actually focuses on me the, saying um, thank you or uh, grateful for, for the house itself. And then s some people actually think that I'm actually pretending or acting to be that way or, or to, to appear that way on, on TV. But really, um, in real life, I am that way or even more so in my uh, pr uh, private life that I'm really appreciative of objects and houses. So this book, so from my experiences, I knew how tidying up makes people really happy and joyful in life. And then making the relationship with ourselves and items or objects um, get better through tidying up. So I, I was firmly convinced that this is going to really change the society. So I had this very clear purpose that this book is going to change the way people um, uh, relate with items that they own or live. So I was thinking about this really catchy um, uh, phrases and titles, and that was my idea from the beginning. So Mr. Kawahara, so uh, as a producer, I think it's really rare to have some, to meet somebody who has such a clear idea about how to go about business and how to deliver messages. Uh, when I was 22, I met her for the first time. I was a college student. And then when I first met her, I thought she was very unique. And then even from back then, tidying up was her, her work. And when we met through a uh, job hunting uh, event, and um, if you know the situation in Japan, people would wear uh, gray or even uh, dark blue navy color um, suits, but she had a, a, a one piece dress and she really stood out from the crowd. So I knew she was very unique um, person. So her ability to produce herself and having a very strong core. So like she actually mentioned herself earlier, she was interested in tidying up since she was five years old. And she's been thinking about how to clean up, how to tidy up. And then she continues to actually pursue that idea and the, 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 the process of tidying up. And then she actually was able to um, put her ideas into words. So that was very big. So even during the uh, job hunting uh, session, she you you felt like she was able to uh, so, so she she knew what she wanted to do and she wanted to give us um, no, I was wearing gray jacket actually. Were you really? Yes, I think it was like, like a white-ish uh, one-piece uh, one dress and gray jacket. So that was what I was wearing, I think. So you had some gray, but still. <laughs> so I don't, I, I don't wear white jacket um, to, uh, to look for a job or job hunting. So yes, the, the white jacket. Um, I started to wear those 
after I became a uh, tidying up consultant independently. So when I was in college, I think I was a, a serious student look, uh, looking for a job. So then you wanted to end all the tidying up in Japan. And then you actually move on to the world, like a global stage. Then you met uh, Mr. Kawahara um, after the uh, uh, job hunting event, and then you got married. And then um, you started to challenge the US market. So you published a book in Japan first, and then published the uh, translated version. What was the, the sequence or the time frame of those uh, 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 series of uh, publications? So maybe uh, Maria-san can talk about that. So after uh, uh, publishing a book in Japan, and then um, we were approached uh, with very um, um, uh, positive um, uh, publisher. I think the first one was from Germany. I think German publisher and some publishing companies in Asian countries. And then we decided to go um, forward with it. And then my book was received very positively and then in that situation, a uh, publisher um, uh, decided to publish my book uh, to the global market. So I wasn't the one initiating or forcing myself to go to the States and publish this book, but it wasn't, it wasn't really me um per se it, rather i was sort of a very um a, a person that, um, who stayed in japan and had this purpose to end tidying up in japan so i wasn't really that eager to go overseas and become successful but um a publisher in the states actually approached me and then that became the uh, the opportunity for me to go to the states. So I wonder if the timing you went to the US when was on the publication was uh, coming out in the US. And if my understanding is correct, you moved to the US specifically to the Bay Area. Is that right? So let me talk about this in a chronological order. So we had the overseas publication or sorry, the US publication offer that was in 2013 but it actually was published in 2014. And at that time, we just got married. I also left the company I was previously working for, so we just started working together. And initially, we were going to the US on a business trip. We first went to San Francisco. And that is because our publisher was located in San Francisco. So that was one of the reasons why we were going to San Francisco on business trips. So initially, we thought it was just going to be published in the US. And we were very honored by this off offer. And we thought, why not, since they were given this opportunity. But to be honest with you, we didn't really think there were going to be that many people who needed help in tidying up or cleaning. Because when you look at the US from TV and the image that you have is that everybody have, has big homes, they have space. So we didn't really think tidying up or cleaning was a huge issue. I, I forgot what the name is. I think there's a pier area. There's a bookstore in the pier area in San Francisco. I, I do know where that is. So that is where we first uh, started selling our book. And it's a rather small bookstore, but we, we had the shelves moved and we were able to give in a space. And I think we had about 30 people who came to see us and we had our first uh, book showing. So Marie was there uh, with an interpreter and she first talked about it. And the reaction we received from the people who attended that event was really great because we were able to find out that many people are really struggling and they really were eager to learn and they were very impressed and I think 
this was the first time we realized that these need to tidy up and cleaning is not just in Japan. And uh, our method that we were talking about were well received and people really understood it. That So the realization was made in 2014. And since then, we have been going to the US on a business trip basis. And fortunately, I believe in 2015, uh, Marie was chosen as one of the hundred of influential people in the world. And with that, it really uh, increased the amount of work we were getting. We were getting on a weekly basis hundreds of inquiries. And that is where we first thought of going to the overseas and actually moving to the overseas and working to the overseas is something that's maybe possible. So that is where we really started. So I'm not really sure but about the bookstore, but if I go, I'll remember. I see. And you live in the Palo Alto area. And did you come to Stanford when you were living around that area? Yes, but we used to take walks. And after a while, you moved to Los Angeles. So there was a change. But before that, so Ms. Kondo, you, you mentioned before that you weren't really interested or thinking about going to the US. And as you know, Mr. Kawara just mentioned that the image of the US is that they have big homes, space, so it's not really a big issue. How, what was your thinking about the US? I mean, what kind of know-hows or knowledge were you thinking about to be successful in the US or were you not thinking about that too much? In the beginning, I didn't know. I went to the US, but I did not know. And we were going there because of this publication opportunity. And I was able to get firsthand experiences and in going into American homes and also helping and tidying up. And that is where I realized that the needs are the same. Before I was just really thinking about, you know, cleaning up, helping tidying up homes in Japan. But when you think about tidying up, you know, I realized from this experience that this is not just a Japan limited thing that I can help out, but I can help out in a more global level and that I will be able to help out. And when I was able to realize that and gain confidence, that's when it became different. So it's not that I had a strategy from the get go. So I had experience teaching, conducting lessons about tidying up and cleaning, and I was able to build up on that experience. And from there, I was able to really realize that, you know, the struggles with tidying up is a universal issue. Of course, there are some differences, how the architecture of homes are different, or some places do not have foyers. In Japan, there's always a shoes closet in the foyer, but in the US, it, there isn't. So there are those kinds of differences. And those were things I had to learn on the go. And from, as I learned, I was able to make small adjustments. In, in Japan, you had media exposure. First of all, you had a book. After that, you have been covered in magazines and you have also made appearances in TV programs. But in the US, you first started off with your book. It became a success. After that, you had your TV show in Netflix. Would you be able to elaborate more on the journey when you through and also why you worked um, to have a TV program Netflix instead of Amazon or ABC? And I'm sure you had a team who, who, who was helping you out. So if you can also elaborate, talk us through how the Netflix program happened. Uh, thank you for that question. So at 2015, Maria was chosen as one of the 100 influential in times, and we moved to the US in 2015. At that time, we were already getting approached that why don't you turn your book into a TV program? And we had many uh, uh, broadcasters approaching us and talking about having TV programs. So we had to think about you know, what we're going to be able to do because we didn't really have any team to support us. And we also did not really know who we should be working with to be able to create this. 
and through our agents, we had to speak with many people. Ultimately, I believe it was in 2017, uh, we were able to create the first program. Uh, Japdal is the production company. Uh, we had a meeting. And that is where we first were able to gain confidence. And let me talk more about what kind of confidence I was able to gain. So there are many production companies. And our book sold very well. So the thinking was because the book sold well, we want to be able to turn it into a TV program. And we had the CEO Gail from Jackal was saying that the Komari method is something can cross borders. Now, regardless of what nationalities, this Komari method is something that should be taught to all people. And he said that to be able to teach this method, we need to have it into a TV program to be able to have visuals, images to be able to teach. So that is what Gail said. And I was thinking about when I first started working with Marie. And I think his thinking was very close to the thinking or the logic I had when I first started working with Marie. And I thought he will be a good match for us. I believe it was 2018, that is when we moved to Los Angeles. So we started filming and in 2019, we were able to have the program TV show ready on Netflix. So that's what happened. And you also asked about why Netflix. To be honest with you, I've never mentioned to anybody about this. The first concept we were thinking maybe we should do something scripted, like a TV drama. You know, TV drama based on facts. But if we were to do that, none of the uh, broadcasters were really interested. They were saying that if we're doing something similar to a reality show, they're interested. So that is when we made a pivot and we were pivoting to some, having something more of a reality TV. And fortunately, uh, we were approached by all platformers that they're interested in filming. And ultimately we chose Netflix. So why Netflix? It's because in terms of the creative, they really respected our opinion. You know, we were able to see that from their attitude, which is why we decided we wanted to work with Netflix. I see. So I know you first was thinking about doing something more scripted. And I believe in Japan, we had one of the famous actresses, Yukie Nakama, uh, to be doing that. But instead of going that route, uh, having a scripted TV drama, you shifted to having a reality TV show. Yes. And this was a time when we already started living in the US. And however, we were starting to understand what it's like, but we haven't lived long enough to be able to truly understand what the needs are. So we were listening to what the uh, producers or the TV companies were saying. So once the production started at the first stage, I'm sure you had to think about or talk about, you know, what kind of families you would like to first visit to help out and how you wanted to uh, film. And you had to select some families that you were going to meet. So through that process, I, I think, you know, from watching the show, I think there were great, many great families. They were featured. How, how did you select those families? Did you have good instincts or did you do the filming, but in the end it didn't turn out so well. So you had to choose another family. How did that work out? If you, if you can answer those questions, I'll be appreciated. Sure. So what we did is this, there were about 60 families that have actually said that they would like to be in the show. And those families uh, filmed a 15 minute video of themselves. And they basically talked about you know, what their struggles with in terms of tidying and what they would like to do in the future. So they were actually filming their own homes and rooms and they were showing it to us and, oh, wow, boy was cluttered. And we could really understand they truly needed help in tidying. So I watched all the videos that got sent over. 
and this is the first time I'm talking about this. So we had an Excel and we kind of put it in Excel to see, you know, what would happen if we were to help those family tidy up. So we were projecting also how much time and energy would be required. And we were also mapping as to what kind of potential issues may happen for each families. And we were also working together with the production companies, the producers, so we were discussing about this. And we also really choose eight families out of the 60. And we chose by the Komari method and how we'll be able to best show and explain a Komari method. We wanted to be uh, able to choose a family where we'll be able to comprehensively able to cover the Komari method. And because this is Netflix, so, so we wanted to also be conscious about who we're watching. We wanted to make sure that the show is going to be for everybody, regardless of what their nationality is, gender is, age is. You know, we wanted to have a TV show that had consideration for diversity. And based on that, uh, we ultimately chose eight families. Well, that is really great. So, Mr. Kawahara, I can understand there was a lot of analysis, a lot of deep thinking involved in the selection of these families. I see. But I have to say, I mean, at that time, we weren't that fluent in English. Well, I guess I can argue that we're still not fluent. Yeah, so, it was a struggle, definitely. Because I couldn't understand what the families were saying in the video, so I had to stop each time check what they were saying. So it was a lot to do. So even reflecting on it, it was a lot of work. I see. So you actually went to those families to tidy up and the show was created. And when I was looking at the show, of course, Marie is the central character, but there's a couple of episodes and you are featuring each of the families in each episode. And, you know, each of the families are reflecting on their life and also thinking about what kind of life they would like to have. And that's something that we can see in each episode. So this was already the structure for each episode before you started filming. Yes. When what I really wanted to focus on when we were creating the show, I mean, this was the same when we were actually writing a book. We really wanted to focus on what Marie was doing at the home. So we wanted to make it very real, uh, wanted to keep it very authentic. That was our number one thing we wanted to do. So you just asked about what kind of process we went through to be able to choose the families. So we didn't have Marie involved in that process because we wanted to her, her to do her, do the same thing she always does. So we only giving her the same information. So in the film, you can kind of see how she starts talking to the family, how they communicate with each other, how she looks at the house. Everything's very real. That's how she works. So that's, um, I think that was just that really like you, you were able to, the audience can see that in front of the camera because we intentionally kept it real. So uh, Komari-san has this very unique um, talent that she can be part of the family. She visits the family and then, uh, in, for example, she went to see a, a, a widower and then um, she was asked to uh, get on the, uh, uh, on the, uh, the ha get a ride with the family, and then she would just hop on. And that that personality um, for Maria san that uh, she would just meet new people and then be part of the family and then start thinking with them. So, so I, I'm not really calculating anything when I'm filming. When I go visit my clients, I'm always trying to be really honest with them and um, tidying up is very personal and I would go see their personal space. And then sometime through that, in the process, 
they will talk about their relationship or issues, family issues. And that happens quite often. And then through that communication, I think naturally I had a lot of experience and learned a lot in how to communicate with those families. But at the beginning, yes, there's crew um, to be fil filming my communication with the family. And that, that was that made me a little bit nervous at the beginning. But gradually, in the process of uh, communication and tidying up with my clients, I did everything started to seem very natural. And I, um, I think I gained that experience and that became my one of my skills. So the, the books and the uh, Netflix program became a huge hit. And um, this, this um, there was a, a, a review uh, talking about the spirituality or the way we think or idea ideas about um, um, Japan or or your ideas being very Japanese. And then um, as um, you're um, working at this um, uh, shrine, um, maybe there's like a Shinto related ideas or notions that you uh, draw on um, or draw from. Sometimes you go visit the house and you greet the house and then that as a um, sociologist myself. So I think there's the uh, very um, uh, usual or daily life and unusual life. So there's like a division into two different worlds or maybe one um, world is, is more pure and clean. One is more um, uh, mundane or daily lives. So that kind of sensitivity or senses, do you think your experiences um, worked as uh, at a shrine? Um, did you have that spirituality as a Japanese person? Or do you think that came with your, um, that, 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 that was more like an internal um, spirituality or that was acquired somewhat? Yes, yeah, some experts actually evaluated my work like that and I'm aware of that but I was really surprised that they actually talked about it they they even mentioned it because that's just I I was just doing what I was doing every day and then some sometimes they they talked only about spirituality or the spiritual background of my my actions my tidying up and I, that actually surprised me. So I think it's just only part of what I do. And then I do it naturally, intuitively. And then that kind of, um, I, I, I wasn't even predicting, I wasn't really as them thinking that that was the, the, the focus, that should be the focus of what I do. So it, it's not nothing like pure or um, sacred actions. It's just what I, that I've been doing since when I was little. I, I'm, I'm trying to be respectful to all these items people own or the house they own. So one time I wrote about working at a shrine and then and then some people, so that, that was just like a part-time job, um, but some people thought that was my profession before I became a, uh, a tidying up consultant. So it's really interesting how people just cut, take out one piece of my, my story and then fo really focus on that. So when I was maybe like in grade school, grade um, five or six, I, I started doing what I was doing even still today. So being my belief uh, or faith in, in, in my um, actions that I respect um, the, the things surrounding me, or I'm really thankful and appreciative and grateful for my life. And I want to create an environment for everyone um, to be comfortable and to feel joy. 
So tidying up for me and for everyone is it means a lot and it's really important. And then we have to learn and be aware that uh, we're we're all supported by the surroundings, the items and then people. And when uh, I purchased something, I remember um, being very excited and happy and excited about purchasing this item. But that was in the past and today I don't feel the same way. So I have to get rid of this item, but I'm still thankful and respectful of that, that item. So that, that feeling was always with me. So it's not like I do this because of my Shinto belief or anything like that at all. So uh, there, there are some relevant uh, questions in the uh, Q&A session. But this uh, relationship between the items or object and people in the States and object and the people in in um, uh, in Japan. Do you think there's a, a cultural or um, social differences in two different countries? Or do you think there's um, similarities in two countries? Uh, in case of Japan, so when we say, uh, okay, let's say thank you to this item and then get rid of this. And then I don't need to explain anything else. People would understand. It's, it happens naturally. And then they, they understood what I meant. And they said, okay, um, let's say thank you and, and then uh, get rid of it. But when I, um, came to the States and then when I say, okay, let's uh, be thankful of this item. And then they said, they asked me why. So that was one of the surprising things. Uh, people in the States, some, some of them by saying thank you and uh, being respectful and then let that go. And then they would probably have like a, a less uh, guilt or uh, feeling less, feel less um, sort of bad about getting rid of items that they don't need or they don't like anymore. So I, I think this is universal. It's uh, regardless of your race or ethnicity, um, I, I explain um, one way or another and then people usually understand what I mean. So when you greet the house, when you enter the house and then say thank you to the house, what's happening in your mind? What are you thinking? What's going on? Um, I, I, I saw some people started to cry when you do that. And that actually surprised me. Yes, it's the same feeling as like you meeting somebody for the first time. Hi, uh, nice to meet you. I'm Maria Kondo. I'm here to tidy up your house. And then the, the house is going to be a little bit messier um, before it's going to be all tidied up. But uh, please uh, uh, provide a support. And then I, I, I do that to the house, to the space. And then feels like it, it becomes easier for me to tidy up that space if I, uh, if I do that, if I have that little internal conversation with the house or the space. So it seems like it's like a spiritual experience for uh, many um, American households um, in, the, in the show. But did you feel that same way with the Japanese family? Um, yes, yeah, um, um, some people actually feel um, surprised or they, they seem surprised when I um, do that and then greet the house, but then they usually accept it very naturally, smoothly, and they, they understand why I did that. But in the States, Uh, some people actually started to cry when I did that. And then that reaction actually uh, was uh, surprising for me to see. So maybe people overseas outside Japan, 
maybe they don't really see such a, an action or behavior in their daily lives. Oh, no. That's very interesting. So now I would like us to move on to content business uh, a little bit. So you have uh, YouTube, uh, uh, Twitter, uh, Mr. Kawahara, you have a big presence on Twitter. So you, uh, you've been utilizing different platforms and I think they have different uh, uh, features and um, strong uh, strength. But uh, uh, we talked about Netflix and how and why you chose it earlier. But other platforms, do you have any challenges or difficulties or any special um, um, benefits, uh, strength, pros and cons? Maybe if you uh, aware of those, like a very individual sort of. Um, uh, specific uh, characteristics of each uh, platform, that'd be great. So I think before we can move, um, uh, talk about uh, each uh, platform, we have to think about how to deliver our message in what way. And uh, working with uh, uh, Maria-san, I've been always thinking about how to uh, deliver our messages. So we have so many people loving this idea from 120 different countries and somewhere on this earth right now, um, someone is tidying up and changing their lives. So after the uh, industrial revolution, people made things, bought things, and then used things and then that was the index people thought of of happiness or a rich um, lifestyle or a wealthy lifestyle or well um, being. So that was a social um, understanding. But when you talk about each individual person, let's see, people, each person started to own more things. And at the same time, urbanization started, and then people needed to move into a smaller uh, places because the rent is high, the, the housing, housing is pretty high. I think another social effect that we were seeing is that because there were many things that people have purchased and it has created clutter, and Marie was living in Tokyo. And because she was raised in an environment where each person of space was very small and it was an issue. And I think that really started the Komari method. Because I think many people were using this approach where when you buy one thing, you have to throw away another. But I think her method was different. It was more of a whole body experience also along with the mind to go through the experience to be able to decide. So any person on this planet will be able to have this common feeling or instinct. And I think that's how she really utilized to be able to uh, message what she was trying to say. And I think the reason why she was successful in crossing all boundaries is because she was doing that. What we're trying to do is thinking about what is going to be useful for the human race that's where we started what will be most meaningful i mean it sounds really grand but in when we initially started it wasn't that grand but when we first started we started listening to many people and their voices and it made us realize when people want to live their ideal lives and a better rich life there's this change point and one change point is tidying that activity And I guess you can say by coincidence and by the fortunate coincidence, we were able to have this opportunity uh, to have, create a show with Netflix and it became a global hit. Let me more talk more about the channels that we're using. 
I think there are mainly four channels where people get information. I mean, by words, pictures, sound, and lastly, by video images. And for all four categories, we wanted to do something that fits all categories. And by sending out messages or communicating, we believe we would be able to send out the messages in a most effective way. I'm the same for Netflix. And Marie has her own Instagram, it has about 4 million followers right now. Tidying is an action that causes physical changes. So it's very uh, compatible with pictures and also video images. And I think that's why many people were able to receive her message well. So based on what you just said right now, compatibility with what kind of channel you use is important, but regardless of what channel you use, you have to be able to have the ching feeling. You need to be able to get some kind of excitement. And that's really important. And I think that's what something that Marie said too. And Marie said that, you know, this wasn't something done strategically or there wasn't any calculation done behind. It was just really about just doing what you felt regardless of what media you were using. Is my understanding correct? Yes. So when you think about producing and how you express something, when you add something or when you take away something, it, it kind of blurs the whole total value of something you're trying to create. So it's really about how you take away what's unnecessary. And with what you're left, you're able to truly sound out the message or convey what you're trying to do. So let me give you an example. So I'm not an expert in creating TV shows. So you can say I'm an amateur in doing this. And there are these producers who have won many awards in Hollywood and they're all here with us, working with us. They're behind the cameras. They're working with the crews and they're with us. They have their incomes and they're all giving directions on what people need to do. I guess you can call it like a before and after. When you have a reality TV show, you know, there's always going to be this huge change which wows everybody. I think that's the standard for reality TV shows. However, with this show, we didn't have that kind of created changes. You know, initially we were thinking of having something where there was going to be this wow factor after some changes were done. But if you were to do that, it's really going to change the outcome and we wouldn't be able to show reality, what's real. So we said, you know, and I think it was my responsibility to put a stop to any kind of artificial or extra activities. I wanted Marie to be herself as she always is in front of the camera. So I have a question uh, related to what you just said, and this was a question coming from the Q&A. So we hear this term metaverse recently. You know, you have your headsets, you have VR, and you also have chat. So the question is, when you, you know, can use AI and chat together, perhaps are we going to have a new service from Takui service or Marie's service? So metaverse is a new service. It's a new thing. Do you have any plans to incorporate metaverse into your future activities or future plans? Or do you not, not have any plans? Uh, what should I do about this? Marie, should I answer this question or would you want to take it? So this is out of my expertise. You take it. So this is just me personally, latest technology, new innovations, new changes. I personally am interested in them. As I mentioned, we first moved to the US and we were in the Silicon Valley. And again, this is me personally. I am a fan of Steve Jobs. So that's how much I like latest technology, new technology. And then this tidying, it's actually very basic human nature in a sense, but with a lot of 
evolving, I think how we're tithing is going to change. So we'll also like to be uh, looking at tithing in that sense. So I interpret your answer as you are interested. So for people who are involved in the contents business in Japan, and I'm sure there are many people who aspire to be successful as Marim. In Japan, there are many people who are already successful using uh, contents. And you know, recently in South Korea, we had the Squid Game, it was a huge hit. Is there any hints you have or advice for people who want to have more contents, uh, not just popular in Japan, but popular in countries such as US or other countries? And maybe there might not be a, a good advice or easy advice, but if you can just talk to this uh, based on both of your experience, if there is anything, any input or any hints, if you can share that with us. What do you think, Marie? Okay, so what I can say from my experience, so I'm sure you have your contents. I think it's really about how you're going to package your contents. I think this is important. For me, in the beginning, I started off with a book. So it was a book, so I was focusing on words I use. And if you're going to go with that route, you need to be able to ask yourself, would you be able to you know, explain your contents and how attractive it is in like short words, in small words? Would you be able to summarize it? I think that's really important. I mean, this is the same for service, also for what kind of value that you're going to be able to provide. So maybe your profile. It's really about how you can keep your profile simple and being able to communicate who will be able to benefit from your contents in short words. And the, the reason I say this is, and the reason why Komari method is well known overseas is because the contents are very simple. And I talk about you know, sparking joy. I think I was really helped by that, by that term. It's tidying times sparking joy equals a better life more joy. So that is my message to the viewers. And I think that's really important for all content creators. Please think about, you know, what's the difference between what you're providing versus other people? What are you able to contribute? I think you really need to dig deep. I think that process is necessary. I personally think you're not going to be able to explain value without words. I have two things I would like to add. First of all, the content holders are the, the creators and you need to you know, make that into a package. I call it crystallizing. It's really about how can you make it so you'll be able to convey that to people. And that's something only the creator can do. So the creator has to do that. And with the package, you're able to move on to the next step the next step is to be able to gather people who have the same understanding. That phase is necessary. So Marie wrote that book. And because she was able to speak to that, that's why I was able to make my decision to leave my company. And I was able to go with her to be able to realize the vision and the mission that she had. So that's a, that was a huge factor for me. And we started in Japan and we moved overseas. And we were able to work together with people who had expertise to be able to you know, share the Komari method to people over the world. So we were able to find people who had the same passion or people who shared the same uh, intentions or feelings. And I think that's really helped. Another point is this. It's really about how you put it into words. So I think there are points that you have to change and also some things that you should not change. And these two things need to be very clear. So Mari, nothing about her has changed. She has been doing the same thing consistently. She has been tidying up. 
But when you go overseas, there are some terms or phrases that's really hard to explain or hard to read between the lines. And those are things that we were adjusting. So we were able to get feedback from the local members and we were able to make some changes. So a good example will be sushi. And I think there's been many research on sushi. I think initially overseas, it was just raw fish on rice. And I think this was something that never existed. But I think there has been some adjustments made to sushi into a California rule. And I think that really caused people to actually try it out. And I think this was a great innovation. So it's not just we're picking up what was created in Japan and taking over a different country. We have to be able to change it up so people overseas in different countries will be able to accept it. So that's something that's very important as a producer and also as a creator of contents to be conscious of those points. So the words or terms actually used is important. And as you mentioned, uh, Mr. Kawaha, that you were the producer. So Marie herself hasn't changed at all, but there had to be some slight adjustments to be accepted. And I think we have received some comments related to that. And I think, you know, Marie has been consistently speaking in Japanese. And we had Ms. Ida, her interpreter, interpret what she was saying Japanese English. And I think this is actually groundbreaking. I mean, maybe we have more of this, but everything is spoken in Japanese and there were subtitles, yet the success was there. And this term, tokimeki English, sparking joy. And I think katazuke in Japanese was mentioned, uh, translated as tidying or cleaning. So there was a lot of translation, interpolation done. So those word choices into English, I think it was done very well. Who, who was involved in doing this? So how to do with the translator who has translated the life-changing magic of tidying up? So that translator has created some of these terms. And I think it was well-received, well-accepted by the US audience. And I think it's like a miracle and I'm very thankful to that translator. So we had many, many questions uh, coming from our audience, but I just want to start summaring up. So Mr. Kohara, you have been the producer and you have been supporting, you have been producing, um, Marie. I think you're the first case that was successful from Japan to the US. So what were some of the uh, success factors? Uh, what went well and what did not go well? I think it's very difficult to be able to kind of guess what will be successful. I mean, we had the ukiyo-e drawings and for some reason, um, the 80s Japanese music has become a hit. So it's really hard to be able to predict what is going to be a hit. And I'm sure you are helping other people with contents, but do you have any idea as to what kind of contents do you want to be able to bring over to the US? Yes, that is a great question. That's the only thing I've been thinking every day, every night. So when you think about the globe and then looking at the uniqueness of Japan. So one of the things we can actually bring to the world is this road or a path. So when you ex really pursue one thing and then master that or how to live your life based on that, I think us Japanese tend to focus on very niche um, thing. It's like this uh, kind of like a, a, a way of doing things that life, um, it's, it's like a tea ceremony or, um, other uh, very specific uh, skills and training that we pursue. So maybe that's uh, probably the most valuable aspect that we can offer to the world in the global market. So any specific person, maybe art piece, any work at this point, for instance, uh, uh, Son Takeda, he's actually my uh, friend, 
um, he's a calligrapher and um, he's actually uh, started to sell himself as the um, artist, a modern artist. And I think it's like really easier. It's like, a, I, I, I think this is the, the, the way he packages his art and the skills as sort of like a, a, a California rolls in a new form for Western uh, cultures to be able to accept it easier. Um, here's another question from the audience. So your relationship, um, you've been um, going through this process together in this business together. And how do you view your relationship? And also you have um, um, children and you have a, a baby. And how does that impact your tidying up your, your own houses, having three kids in the house? Uh, what should we do? So the first question about our relationship. I can answer that. So that does it mean that we're actually not in a good relationship in our private life? Uh, no, I think, um, is there any like a gender in influence um, in what you do um, in, in, in producing Maria-san? So no, anything gender related doesn't really impact my decisions. So I think we have different strengths nothing to do with other, our gender. I think people who would take my lessons um, when they, they would notice that, but I can really focus on tidying up and that's what I do and that's my strength. And I, I just go really deep dive in my skills and expertise. But from a, a broader perspective, or maybe how to approach clients. Those very subjective, um, objective, excuse me, um, um, the advice uh, came from uh, Takumi-san and I would adjust or modify how I approach my uh, business. So I think we have different strengths and I think in both business and private, We always uh, sit down and talk about that and analyze each other's strength. I like cooking. I don't like tidying up. I don't like cleaning up after I eat. So things like that. So rather than gender differences, it's like a personal individual differences. And then we, we really needed to talk about it in our process of coming um, here and then leaving Japan, coming to the States and we can't even speak English. We have small kids and we, we have to um, uh, manage our household. And um, move on with our businesses. So I think that that discussion, that negotiation was necessary. So um, in Japan, I think um, uh, Komari method uh, consultants, I think they're mostly women in Japan, especially. But how about in the States about gender um, difference? Is there a difference? Yes, overseas, I think uh, we have more uh, male consultants compared to what we have in Japan. What do you think, Maria-san? So um, in Japan, a lot of uh, women's magazines, it's like there's a long history of this tidying up um, topics or cleaning related topics dealt in women's magazines focused mostly on women in Japan. So that repetition, that kind of uh, almost like a, a, a repetitive message that we receive as women growing up in Japan, that probably um, has some kind of impact. 
but um in uh 10 years i think started it, about 10 years ago i think it started to shift um and then have more male consultant so that in japanese very uh, traditional sort of values that women stay home and then clean the house and then men go out and work that that might have um something to do with that um gender gap so yes um perhaps a, a, a new idea would be like the how to tidy up your desks or office spaces um in business scenes for mail that's that's um that's another approach yes uh, we can talk about how to organize data especially if if we are working more and more from home and then we want to learn how to design and produce the uh, space and environment to work individually, personally, catered to your work. So that's another aspect that we can uh, we can uh, uh, challenge. And another question here is that uh, Komari san has become a cultural icon that um, we. Um, we have in Japan, and um, you have perhaps received negative um, uh, feedback and negative perceptions about what you do or who you are through media. How do you how do you address that? E yes, back then I was I used to get really deeply hurt. Uh, from each comment, each negative comment. And then there was like one comment that was not positive and I would lose my energy and feel uh, depressed and sad for about a month. But then the more I received those negative comments and then I started to learn that this is, this is just a fact in life. Oh, of course I get hurt, I get, I get sad or depressed when I see those comments, but in a way I'm getting used to those comments. I don't know, I'm not getting used to it, but it's, it's I'm accepting the fact that there are people who would view me, who would think of me that way. Then always I have, I go back and think, okay, what do I want to do now? Do I stop doing what I do? But whenever I feel down, I sit down and talk with Takumi-san. And then we think about why I'm doing what I'm doing. And then when I think about that, what I want to do is to reach out to more people and then make them happy and to make their life more joyful. And then that's my mission. And then in that journey, we, uh, we have this confirmation about what I do or what we do. And then that's my mission to change the world a better place through what I do. Yes, I'm. I I met with her when I was in junior high uh, in in college, and then I saw the actual real life process of her being this worldly known person, and then in that journey together, um, walking next to her. I think she wouldn't be able to um, deliver her message if she was a um, more self-centered person thinking about or prioritizing herself. But through what she does, she's touched so many lives, changed so many lifestyles. And then as a result, I think it's more like a prayer or a wish our hope that if we keep sending this message that we, we send, then 
through all these people who would um, who would try our method and change their lives, I think the world uh, will become more um, a, a better place. People will become more thankful, appreciative, and respectful of each other. So um, we are um, approaching the end of the uh, the seminar um, session. But if you would like to um, say a, a quick uh, word about new endeavors and new challenges, new directions going forward, maybe moving on to Chinese markets or um, maybe um, additional, if you have any additional message to the um, audience and viewers today, um, please uh, go ahead, uh, Maria-san, uh, you can start. Um, Thank you um, so much for uh, listening to our talk today. Um, there, there are so many people joining us um, today, and I'm really grateful. And then when I um, uh, wrote um, the the book, uh, um, the life changing magic of tidying up, I I've actually haven't changed at all. I've um, been always. Um, telling you the same message is showing the same way. So I'm hoping uh, through my method, um, each and individual person can find their joy in life. I want to say two things. Uh, first is about the vision about Marie Kondo going forward. So like I said, so um, there's if there's messy space with a clutter and then this um, um, uh, space uh, occupied with so many items and objects, I would like to uh, we, we will continue working um, to change that and we would continue to change the system or the method to make that better and then at the end we we'll, would like to see the end of messy uh, spaces and then this world, a uh, new world, uh, full and filled with joy. Um, we, um, that's what we would like to achieve. And then the, the second uh, point is that uh, for people who, um, who think that I'm, uh, we are uh, challenging to go um, global, um, and then if we can be the uh, pioneer in doing that, have some kind of contents or skills or messages to share, and then we actually pioneered to uh, produce ourselves and be um, um, a, a bigger voice in um, global on a global scale so if you would like to uh, do something like that please contact us and we might be able to help you so i've been um the holding planning seminars on uh, international relations and um, um and um sociology um perspectives but a lot of uh, feedback actually says the uh, message from uh, people in japan are uh, weak and i think uh, today uh, we learned that if we have a passion and have a strong session a uh, sense of mission of what we can do to change the world um, a better place then um, now uh, i think we all learned uh, from um, uh, talking uh, with you that um, it's entirely possible so uh, uh, Kana-san and Denise organized this event and interpreters were uh, Rie and Chio. So thank you very much for um, your work. And um, hopefully uh, today we had this online session, but I would like to invite you both to uh, the physical campus of uh, Stanford University. Thank you so much for your time today.